Hi, so my name is Blaine Butler. I'm a product owner at the Center for Open Science, or COS. Um, COS is a nonprofit organization with a mission to increase the openness, integrity, reproducibility of research by making open scholarship practices easier and more normative. One of the ways in which COS enables us is through the development and maintenance of the Open Science Framework, or OSF. So how's this webinar gonna work? Um, this one is mostly a hands-on webinar, so I'll be demonstrating a lot of the things that you can do on the OSF, like on the screen. Um, if somebody, there's also a um, document that has a kind of a follow along. If somebody could drop that in the chat, and we'll also go out with the follow up email. Um, in addition, there are colleagues here also from uh, Center for Open Science who can answer questions. So feel free to please drop those in the Q&A. Um, and then that will also go out with our follow-up email along with slides um, and, our, and a copy of the recording. So um, yeah, but first we're gonna do a brief poll to see how familiar you are with the OSF. Okay, so most of you seem like you have an OSF account, but only feeling somewhat familiar with using the OSF. Okay. Um, here are the topics we're gonna cover today. Um, we're gonna go over your account and your profile, um, discovering content, so search on the OSF, uh, research planning, Put that away. And uh, so registrations and pre-registrations, then study management and collaboration, which I think of as like the, the core of the OSF, which is OSF projects. Um, and then research sharing, so OSF preprints, and then relationships, how you can connect all of these resources across the OSF um, in order to like, you know, boost your profile and boost your digital presence. Okay. So what is the OSF? Um, the OSF is a free open source um, online research platform that was designed to support researchers, allowing them to openly and transparently share their work throughout all the stages of the research life cycle. That includes searching, developing ideas, designing studies, finding materials, collecting data, storing the data, analyzing the data, um, and then finally writing up your report and publishing your report. Um, so this is the entire research life cycle. This is, you know, our platform is a free platform to like enable this and then also allowing a lot of collaboration throughout that process. Um, so we'll start with account and profile. So going to the OSF, oops. So if you do not have an account, although most of you do, you can just sign in. Um, mine is populated. If you want to, you can sign in using your ORC ID. Um, and if you are an OSF institutional member, you can also sign in through a single sign-on with your institution. Um, if you are unsure if your institution is an institutional member, you can check that real quickly. and you can just search the institutions. So if I were still a member of, oops, sorry, I was on our test server. Same thing. If I were, um, like I, I graduated from James Madison. If I were still, if I still had access to my email there, I could log in through my James Madison email and I would be affiliated with that institution. But as I am no longer at James Madison, 
I'm going to sign in with my COS password. And from here, I can go to my profile. And I have connected my ORC ID, and I've also connected um, my uh, LinkedIn account. Um, within my um, profile, I go to settings. And let's say you need to, um, you can kind of get an idea of what your, how your name will be displayed in a citation. Uh, the more important thing is your account settings. So right now, my primary email is blaine at cos.io, but let's say I move institutions or um, I, want, I prefer to use my uh, Gmail account. Um, I can just type in a new email address here and add that. And then And then I can add that email. And then if I need to, I can make that my primary email as well. Um, another nice thing you can do from your profile is let's say your institution um, is, is, is in the US or in the UK, um, you can set your default storage location. So there are four different storage locations you can set to automatically default to the United States, um, Australia, Canada, Germany, all um, these storage locations are based upon the requirements for data storage within these um, countries. And then Germany is the default for anything in the European Union. Um, but I just set mine as the United States. And then connected identities, I've already connected my ORC ID. Um, and then generally we recommend using two-factor authentication. I had turned mine off. Okay. You can also connect and disconnect um, individual accounts with other services through your account, through your profile, which is a really nice feature. Um, all right, so let's go to search and see what we can find. So um, we updated our search fun functionality just last year. So there's a really nice function here. If I wanna look at projects and I wanna see those which have been funded by the NSF, I can just um, filter for that. I can also look for licensing. So anything that would be um, CC by international or uh, by at CC by uh, international. And then I can pull all of those. The other nice thing about this is that you can then copy. And paste. And then that is um, a shareable uh, search function or search filter that you have created. Um, you can also look at other items such as registrations. Um, and then you can see that certain registrations have the ability to have data, code, materials, papers, or supplements. Um, and you can filter by that as well. So if you want to see any registration that has data associated with it, um, you can pull those up as well. So going back. So now we've kind of gone over briefly just account and profile. Um, and we did the search. So now let's talk a little bit about research planning. So registrations and pre-registrations. Um, and like I mentioned, like this is a very brief overview of the entire OSF. So um, hopefully in the future, we'll have some deeper dives into things like registrations and pre-registrations or search. 
each of these topics, I we literally could spend like an hour going through all of the functionality and things you can do within this section. So um, why should you pre-register your uh, study? So a pre-registration is a time-stamped read-only version of the research plan created and submitted to a public registry before the study is conducted. Um, Pre-registrations are a formal, transparent story of your study. It decides what your or this describes what you're planning on doing, um, and then any updates that you need to make during the study, you can put in your registration. So it's a very transparent process for um, you know logging what you think is going to happen and then updating that hypothesis as you go along. Um, you know, one of the things we try to do is say, think about it as a study management plan that accompanies your data management plan. So, you know, as you come up with maybe variations on your hypothesis, this is a good place to log those to make sure you're understanding when those changes occur and how they occurred in a very transparent manner to share with your colleagues. Um, registrations versus pre-registrations. So the big thing about the difference in that is just to think about that a pre-registration is completed before the data collection has begun or data has been looked at. That is the big difference between a pre-registration and, and a registration. Registrations can be uh, created at any time. A pre-registration must be done before you've begun to collect and look at your data. So let's go ahead and start a registration now. Um, so in order to start a registration, you'll just go into the OSF registries. You can add new. Um, I'm going to say that, no, I do not have an existing project. Uh, I'm going to do just for uh, for um, time's sake, I'm just going to do an open-ended registration. If you need to see anything about what types of registrations there are, we have our support page. And there are templates. So there's registrations 101. So then here are all, all the different templates that are and explained what, how, what the description is, and then you can look at the template before you start using it. So I'm just going to do an open-ended. And when you create a registration, the, nice, the, the first thing you should know is it starts off as a draft form. Um, you can add contributors here. Um, there's also various permissions that you can give to contributors on your registration. Um, if you want more information about contributor permissions, you can also go back to the help guide. And this has examples of what various permissions are, admin, read, write, or read, and how those are categorized for various uh, components, uh, content on the OSF such as registrations, projects, um, and preprints. So I'm adding Daniel, who's one of my colleagues, as a read-write contributor. So now you can see he's added to the contributors list. Um, I'm affiliated with the Center for Open Science. I can choose to affiliate or unaffiliate that. And then I have to choose a license. Um, various, if you're submitting to a branded registry, um, we have a few of those for specific reasons. They may have certain uh, licenses that you must pick. If you are at all confused about what type of license you need, um, you can also look here for some guidance on licensing. Um, 
But the best thing to do in those situations is check with your institution to see what type of license is required or your funding agency. So I am going to just pick CC by international um, and then subject, big fan of physical sciences. And then one other thing that I think is not utilized as much as it could be is tags. So um, using tags to make your information uh, more discoverable is a really good idea. Um, we, we say in here, add a tag to enhance discoverability. So if you're working on vaccines or um, a certain disease, those are good things to make your um, work content more discoverable and easier to find for those others searching the OSF. So here we go. Next. So now you need a summary. Oops. Um, if you need to add any supplemental files, you can do that here. Or data. Um, I have some standard documents I just use. Hey, so um, I've added a file. There it is. I've provided a summary. I'm going to now review. Um, you can then edit any of this metadata from the review page. And then if I hit register, this would then go and send me an email and anybody else who is an admin contributor on the registration. Um, I am going to show you one thing. So when you click register, um, there is this option to make your registration public immediately or enter into an embargo. An embargo means that your registration would be private for up to four years. If you think that you are going to publish or you want to create like a view, an anonymous view only link to your registration, this is a really good time to make sure you, sub, um, you select an embargo and then make it for as long as you want because you can always end an embargo early. Okay. I am not going to actually submit this registration. I don't want to throw off any of our metrics. Um, and then I'm just going to and notice the draft is saved. Um, so if I would go into my draft registrations, I could find this later, but I'm just going to delete the draft. And you can see any other drafts I have. Yeah, <laughs> Whenever I do these, I end up sometimes creating uh, draft registrations. All right, moving on. Um, home. Um, one of the nice things about registrations, as I mentioned before, is the ability to update them. So um, here is an example of an updated registration. Um, and so they updated their registration to say that this protocol has paper has been published um, and they associated that with the update um, and that was the update. So just as an example, you can also update to say um, we changed the number of people we were going to survey based upon some early initial results. Um, those are other updates that you can, um, any type of change you can update within your um within your registration. All right, so now let's go to create a new project. Actually, I'm gonna do something really fun. Okay. So I'm gonna do getting started on the OSF. We have a bunch of videos you can see about getting started, how to start. Um, we also have some templates. Creating a project from a template. Mm 
But I'm just going to start and create a new project. Yeah, yeah. Um, and like I said, um, when I was showing off my uh, profile settings, my default storage location is the US. But let's say that I was working on a project that was funded by um, some like a, an institution in the UK. I would then potentially I could select um, yeah. Germany as my storage location. And you can see that my affiliation is this is the Center for Open Science. Um, and I can remove that or leave that affiliation here. So now that I've created that project, I'm going to go to it. And this is where um, the add-ons that I talked about were kind of helpful. But before we get to that, so now that I have a test project, I can create components, or now that I have a project, I can create components in that project. So, um, and then I can add any. Yeah. So, I'm going to create that. So when you initially create a project, it is private. Um, and then any component you create would also be initially private. So one of the things that you can then do, um, and this is really nice, is that you can change the privacy settings on any as or any piece of your project. So um, if I want to make my project public, but I want to keep this component private, I have that ability. I'll go to make public. Um, and here you get the warning that it wants to make anything public on the internet. The internet is the internet. And it that it could linger. People could have grabbed screenshots. So even if you change your privacy settings back to private, people may have already pulled information or gathered um, things off gathered from your content that was at one point public. And so, like I said, I can either make all public or I can make um, just the overall project. So just the test project public and leave this component private, which is what I'm gonna do for demo purposes. So just the, um, the big part or the larger test project is going to be public, um, but yet, since I'm um I created this, I can still see the private component and I'll demo this real quick too. So if I go to that project from a different browser, all I see is the bigger test project. So the component that is private is not viewable to the public. And so now I can put things in, into this private component. Um, so let's say I want to have data um, that I want to share with other collaborators on my project, but I want it to be private until we've had a chance to analyze it, or it's been through um, an external review board, or it needs to go to a funder first. Um, this is one, this is an ability to do that. So I'm going to go and use so I am so, so we have a data set. And now this data set is in a private component, so it is viewable to anybody else on that I add to the project. So, and if you want to add additional people to your project, kind of the same as what you did with the register, or has, what I demoed with the registration. Um,
with the annual gifts for being out on PTO today, he gets added to all of the projects. And I'm going to give him an admin permissions. And let's say I want to add somebody who is not registered on the OSF. So there are no um, results found for Kyle Gumluck. That's my husband. <laughs> so I can add him as an unregistered contributor. And so all I need, and I've used this example before, kgumlock at gmail.com. And he will get a notification that he has been added to a project and then he can create an OSF account, which he is not allowed to do because then I can't use him as my example. So and now I've added him. And just as I add him as an unregistered uh, contributor, I can also adjust those permissions to be read, read, write, and admin. And so now he's listed. But um, as you can see, since he's not, he doesn't have an OSF account, you can't click on his profile. You can for everybody else. Um, another nice thing you can do that I don't think I've demoed before is you can create a view only link. Um, so let's say that you want to share this anonymously. You can do that. So if you want just people to view it, but not to be able to do anything to your project, um, testing. And then there's this really nice functionality called anonymize. And so if you create an anonymous view only link, and then copy that, and then I'll go back to my other browser somewhere. You can see that I created a view only link just for the private component. Um, it's an anonymous link. So everybody just says anonymous contributor. And then um, you can see the data set but it's anonymized. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, one of the other things that I can show you with the private, uh, with the project, is um, your add-ons. So like I disconnected them from my profile, I can also just add them to a project. So one of the other things, um, let's say you use Google Drive and you want to share um, certain um, content in your Google Drive with other collaborators on your project. I can go to Google Drive and enable. And now I need to connect my account. And I'm gonna select my COS account. And then you get an allow to, um, to allow OSF to um, access your Google account. And so now, um, you can connect either your entire Google Drive or if you create folders within your Google Drive that are specific to, let's say, this project or um, just content you wish to share versus sharing everything, that is one way to go. I have a test folder that I always use um, for sharing because I don't want to connect my entire Google Drive ever. <laughs> so I'm going to go ahead and select that and then save. Um, another, because uh, we have a bunch of different add-ons, we're working to increase the number of add-ons as we move forward. Um, there's citation add-ons. So 
Um, there's also Zotero or Mendeley. I'm more familiar with Zotero, so I use that. And in a similar fashion, you also have to connect the specific account. And then um, you create a key or key is created to allow the OSF to access your Zotero account. So um, once you've connected your Zotero account, you want to make sure you um, select a library. So you can select your entire library, or just like with Google Drive, you can select um, folders within a library. So I'm going to select uh, BB Haas as mine. And then within that library, you can also, um, yeah. So now I go back to my test project. And you can see the Google Drive, um, which is here. And there are um, certain files associated with that drive. I can also see, oh, my Yeah, I forgot to connect the folder with all the documents in that one, so save. And now you can see all of the um, the specific citations within that COS folder. Um, and then you can then. And so anybody else on your project or that can view your project can also go and access um, these citations. So it's a really nice way to share your citations with your co colleagues um, and also with the public if you want to make sure you're referencing um, previous work and, you know, giving credit to previous, uh, previous researchers. Okay. So, um, like I mentioned, you have affiliated institutions, Center for Open Science. Another thing you can do is you can create a DOI for your project. I'm not going to do that because minting a DOI costs money, but um, in order to do that, you would just create a DOI. You can also um, create a registration from a project. So as you can see right now, there are no registrations with this project. So you would just click new registration and you have the same options as with you're just creating a registration um, from the homepage. So um, I can choose whatever registration I want. A nice thing about creating a registration from a project is that um, Let's see, let's go to this, let's pick the physical sciences, the same thing before, tags, um, next. So if you want to add files, the same as before, uh, summary, let's see. Any files that you upload for your registration will automatically be added to the project. So that's a nice feature. So if I want to add um, my lorem ipsum PDF, which is what I'm going to do. And then same as before, um, you get to review everything. Oh, I forgot. My, oh, I forgot the license. So yeah, so as you can see, when I went to review, this was red because I hadn't filled out a piece of that. And then it tells me that the license can't be blank. I can also edit that from here. So I'm going to do international. And so now you see everything is green and I have the ability to register that or delete the draft. So I'm going to once again delete the draft because I don't want to create a registration. 
I was just demoing that real quick. Um, you can also edit your tags here. Okay. And let's say I don't want to delete the draft, but I'm not ready to submit it yet. I can just um, go away, go back to my test project and go to my registrations. Oh, and there's the draft. So if you just navigate away, it saves the draft. Um, you can always come back and change it. Let's say you're the document you want to add, your supplemental, you know, data set um, you haven't gotten from a collaborator or you're waiting on some more information, you can start your registration and finish it at any time. So, or you can create a new registration and leave this one hanging. Um, but like I said, I'm going to just delete this because I don't need to have excess content. Um, and then now there are new draft registrations and there's no registrations. So um, one of the things that I did um, is I showed, you know, a project. Um, there are lots of uh, projects and components and a lot of different ways that you can um, systematize or structure your project. Um, you can have, have like an entire research lab as like the title of your project. And then within each of the, within that, you can have different research initiatives and then within each of those, so that would be like a component. You could have their hypothesis, the data protocol, any lab notebooks, if you want to have digital lab notebooks. Um, so that's one way to structure. I've also seen, let me go to, my projects. Um, so I, <laughs> I have this one is called cool projects. Um, and we can share this with you too. Uh, it's the University of Texas Dallas lab organization template. I think this is a really nice structure. You have a whole component for announcements, administrative documents, SOPs, lab protocols, meeting notes, and journal club. This is a really nice structure, um, a really nice way to set up a lab um, organization template. And um, as you can see with the affiliated institution, University of Texas at Dallas is one of our members. So it's always really nice when we can um, share uh, content created by a member that they have created as a template. Um, and this is also really nice. I could work this. So I could fork this project or I can duplicate the template. Right. So now I've duplicated their template. I have the exact same thing. However, the only contributors are me um, and anybody else I choose to add, but it basically just took their template and template it again, um, which I think is a really nice feature and functionality. And we have other uh, projects in our template um, uh, place on in the help where you can find that. Let me send out a tips and tricks. Um, templates. So we have a bunch of different templates for our lab manager research group coursework. Um, there's a lot of, uh, we've seen classes that host their class, um, putting slides and presentations, recordings. There's an electronic lab notebook, data management template, research team coordination. Um, these are just some blank templates that we have available for you to help you kind of ease your way into getting started on the OSF. Um, so look through these templates. And, okay, 
So, and then you can always change this. You know, you can change the, um, and like I said, these are all private until I choose to make anything public, but I can change this name if I'm going to be like, you have the ability to edit that template to suit your needs um, and be more specific to what you would need to do with this project and how you want to structure it. So if I want to say that these are just announcements from the PI, um, if you want to have general announcements or, or lab work discussions or updates on the daily work in the lab. Um, another thing that uh, I always I kind of forget, and I think everybody else does too, is there's this beautiful thing called the wiki. And you can use this wiki to communicate with your uh, collaborators. So um, one nice thing, like if you have a private component um, that has data in it, you can tell people if they want to request access for that data to input instructions in here. You can also put in updates. You can put in um, images, um, anything you want to share and to kind of make your project page look nice. Sir, um, I could show you. So um, like I, I have this project called Cool Projects. These are just things I find on the OSF that I think are really neat or cool. And so uh, this wiki has um, no images, but it has a really good detail about, um, you know, what this virtual museum is, who help, who's helped create it, um, location, more information, licensing, all of that. Um, we also have a couple of other another project and they use their wiki yeah so this is the alley lab wiki um they use this and it's it's really well um to uh share a lot of information so they have you know, the overall this is a wiki applying for phd programs forms and flyers irb lab management lab orientation um, these are all just really nice examples that we find on the OSF and um, try to share. Um, there's also information for their lab website, their lab manual, um, and then other information. So uh, the wiki is a really nice place to share a lot of other information about your the work you're doing or links to um, other information that could be helpful for people viewing your project. Okay. I'm gonna go to our, oh no. So um, the other thing I was going to show is how you can do an OSF preprint. So we will go back here. Oh, wait, no. And this is um, our test server. So if I want to create a preprint, and this would just be just the same as on our regular server. So I can upload from my computer. I can also um, drag and drop a file. 
I like uploading from my computer because it's easier. And so I'll use the same lorem ipsum <laughs> document I have. Um, and just like what I mentioned with registration, certain uh, preprint providers, um, if you are choosing someone other than the OSF, um, but even the OSF has certain licensing requirements. So um, to have a preprint on the OSF, it has to either be a CC Universal or a CC by International. If you have a um, peer review DOI, you can add that here. You can also come back later and edit your preprint to add that. Yes, Mark. I don't know if you meant to share your screen or not, but you're not sharing. Oh, I stopped sharing screen. Oh, whoops, sorry. Oh my gosh, okay. I'm gonna go back and do this again. Oh wait, I didn't hit share. Sorry, I thought I was still sharing screen. <laughs> okay. Um, I'm going to cancel and we'll do this again. Okay, so submit a preprint. And so you can select a service. So there's um, the OSF preprint provider. There's also um, Eco Evo RIX, um, Law Archive or Law Archive. Um, there's a focus ultrasound archive at archive. Yeah, select whatever preprint provider um, is suitable for your material. Um, I just use the OSF. Like I said, you can upload from your computer. There's the lorem ipsum um, document that I use for everything. Author assertions. Um, I'm just going to say not applicable for these as a demo. Um, like I mentioned earlier, without showing you, um, you have to choose a license, and different preprint providers have different licensing requirements. Um, so I'm going to pick CC by International. Um, if you have a DOI, um, you can add that now. Like, let's say this is a published um, work already, but you're sharing, uh, you're choosing to make uh, that accessible for everybody. So it's not stuck behind a paywall. You can do that as well and share the DOI. Um, or you can come back in after you've created your preprint and edit that at a later date. Update it when your preprint um, gets accepted. Life sciences. Um, once again, the more you can um, se select specifics and be very specific about where your what discipline your work falls under, the more discoverable you can make it. Um, biotechnology. I like biology. Um, you can also choose to add other authors. So I'm adding fake person, which is one of my other accounts. Um, as an admin on this. And if you want them in the citation, you can choose that too. But you always have to have at least one person who is cited as, as work as um, contributing to this work. Um, then there's a conflict of interest statement. And then you have the option to 
um, add any supplemental materials. So uh, you can either create a new OSF project to add supplemental materials to, or you can connect an existing one. I'm going to do that. As project one. Okay, so um, for uh, demonstration purposes, um, OSF is using host moderation on our test server, which means that this preprint is publicly available and searchable, um, but not really. <laughs> um, and then, like I mentioned before, you have the ability to edit your preprint. Um, so let's say that your preprint gets, um, or your article gets uh, accepted into another um, journal and you want to add, update that, you can go into the basics. You can add the DOI from the peer review publication if you want to. Um, you can always also update your abstract. Um, if you need to change your version, you can... Um, update file. So let's say I wanted to add a different file. And so now you can see that there is a second version of my preprint. Um, and only the most recent version is the one that is viewable. However, you can always download the original version um, simply by choosing that, or you can select download here. Um, one thing to note that there are views and downloads like analytics that we capture. Um, however, you cannot uh, boost your own analytics by um, viewing and downloading your own material. Okay, so we've done preprints. Um, the last thing I want to go over is connected resources across the OSF. Um, so one thing that is really nice about the OSF is that... Uh, oh, whoops. Um, once you create your account and profile, um, you can associate that with an affiliate with your institutional affiliation, which has a ROAR ID. Um, if you link your ORCID and then you get DOIs for your content, all of that will go through your ORCID. And then all of those things are kind of discoverable on the OSF and they create a whole uh, beautiful PID map of everything that you're doing related to your research that is easy to find and discoverable for everybody else that you work with. Um, and then final, um, need help or have questions? Um, we have a whole bunch of videos, uh, short ones and longer ones. We have the OSF Support Center, which I kind of showed you a few times when I was looking up some things. Um, the tips and tricks, which are also provided through the Support Center, but we send out monthly tips and tricks. Um, we also have a support desk, um, lots of other webinars and events, um, organizational partnership. If you think your institution should um, be affiliated and have an institutional membership, please reach out. Um, we also, not as new now, um, but a month ago, we launched an office hours. And so if you want to schedule time to, um, to bring your pro problem to a, you know, a COS a uh, person, like a staff member, to help you um, sort out what you want to do on the OSF. Um, An email, our follow-up email will have links to these office hours where you can schedule like 15-minute sessions to get help with your specific problem. Um, and then that, you know, that way it gives you some one-on-one -on -one time and allows you to really dig in and get questions answered as well as get a better understanding of how to use the OSF. 
Okay, I'm sorry. I went all the way to time. I usually end early. I don't know. Uh, real quick, closing poll. Hey, Blaine, while they're answering that, during a time check, we have two minutes left and we have several questions still going through the Q&A. Since we are likely not going to have time, well, how can we best respond to those with those questions? Um, we can send out Q&A. We'll send out the ones that are already answered through the follow-up email, and then we can get answers to the Q&A that are not unanswered um, and send those out as well. Well, thank you. Just to make sure that everyone's had their questions answered. Well, I'm glad most of you seem to felt like you learned a little bit of something here. I always feel rushed. <laughs> but there's so much to talk about with the OSF and there's so many things you can do. Um, thank you all for attending. Uh, it's really nice to see large turnouts like this on a Monday morning. Um, so, or I don't know, midnight in Australia. So yes, thank you again so much for coming.